Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And speaking of babies, I'm happy to announce that Ellen is 33 weeks pregnant, which is awesome. So we're almost at that point, you know, all the different birth classes, and it's wow. Praise God. Uh, and we're having a boy, so that's awesome. Yeah. Our, our tentative due date is September 9th, but you guys all know the baby will come when he wants to come, right? So we're praying and uh, preparing things for our baby, and we're so excited. I know many of you have been a part of our birth journey and our story, so thank you for praying, and thank you for being a support for us. We're so excited for this next season of life. Uh, today, we are going to uh, learn and take some time on the topic of hearing God's voice. Um, we're going to take a break in the book of Acts. In fact, Rob loves Acts chapter 13, where we're at so much that he says, you can teach on anything, Aaron, but Acts 13. So he says, you need to hear from the Lord and bring something from his heart for us. And as I've been praying and preparing and seeking counsel, the Lord has put upon my heart and confirmed that this is such an important topic for us today, hearing God's voice. Whether you've been walking with the Lord for 10 uh, years or even decades or even just 10 days, it's so important for us to know God's voice. And by no means is this going to be an exhaustive study. There's so much to be said about hearing God's voice. But I hope for today to be a place of encouragement, a place for you to start to scratch the surface on what it would be like to hear from the Lord yourself and walk with Jesus. So let's start here in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. I'll read that verse for us. We'll pray and we'll dig into it. So Zephaniah 317, turning your Bibles to the Old Testament book, Zephaniah 317. If you need a Bible or don't have one, you can raise your hand and some ushers in the back will go get you a Bible. You can take that. I will take that expense. <laughs> so we have a couple of hands, uh, ushers, just around. Keep them up so they can find you. We would love to give you a, a Bible. And again, take that home for you for your, uh, so you can read the rest of the week. Zephaniah 317. I'm reading from the New King James Version. The prophet writes, The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God who speaks and is willing and wanting to speak to us even today. Jesus, as we take some time to make ourselves available, would you teach us to hear your voice? Would you give us ears to hear what your spirit has to say for us today? I pray, Lord, that we would know you, that we would experience a touch of heaven because we've met with you today, and we ask that you would speak to our hearts, minister to our needs, and show us yourself. In Jesus' name we pray and we say, amen, amen. amen. Have you ever been driving in your car and you're trying to find that perfect song in the playlist and so you're kind of like skipping that song and listening to like a few seconds and then having to skip again because it's not the right song and you never come to that place where you, actually that's the song I've been missing? Or have you ever been uh, laying on your bed at the end of the day feeling, I feel like I'm forgetting something or I'm missing something. It's kind of like that feeling when you know you're supposed to have something and then you leave the door and then you leave the door and you're in your car, you're on your way to the event and then you're like, I forgot this. Well, I would venture out to say that that missing feeling is actually a touch of the Lord and hearing his voice. I believe that we are created to hear God's voice and to know his heart. The beautiful thing about the Lord is that he is omnipotent yet intimate. And today, we get to hear his voice. If you ever struggled with the pastors who say, I I've heard from the Lord or the Lord impressed upon my heart or God spoke this to me and you're like, how does God do that? You're not alone. In fact, growing up in the church, I would hear those missionaries or those pastors, and I'd be like, oh, they're super saints. Like, they can hear from God. But the truth is, Emmanuel, God with us, God is the one who is speaking to them, and he's able to speak to us. And this promise of him speaking to us is not just for them, but it's for everyone. Amen? Amen. So the goal of today is to better learn how to hear God's voice and know when he speaks. So the format of today, the outline is this. Number one, does God still speak today? Obviously, it's a? Yes. 
but I'm gonna give you a theological framework as to why we say yes. I'm gonna give you a foundation on which to build that case of why we believe that God still speaks today. Number two, we'll talk about how does he speak, okay? We're gonna talk about what the voice of the Lord sounds like. We're gonna talk about some encouragements in learning to listen because it is a journey, and then we'll spend some time talking about practical application, and I do wanna give some time at the end of our service for a time of response because I believe that responding to what the Lord is doing in our lives is so important that I wanna give some time to do that. So number one, does God still speak today? Calvary Vista says? Yes. Yes. And just like the verse that we just read, not only does he speak, he also sings. What a beautiful truth that is. Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I've often prayed this and I should pray it again, but I've asked the Lord oftentimes, Lord, I want to hear the chorus and the lyrics that you have for my life. Lord, I want to know the lyrics that you've written for my marriage or for my future children. Jesus, let me know. Give, give me that, 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 the lyrics. I want to hear your voice. I want to know those words that you're singing over me. I find a great comfort that God, the one who spoke everything into existence, Genesis 1, right? 1, 1, the Lord spoke everything in times past, is able to speak to us today. And he is, yes, all-powerful but he's also so intimate with us. We say omnipotent, yet intimate. What a beautiful grace that is. So how do we know that God speaks to us? We know because he not only sings, but in Hebrews chapter one, verses one and two, the author of Hebrews writes to all the believers. He says this, God, who at various times and in various ways in time past spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. So God speaks to us by his son, Jesus. He still speaks today. And Jesus' ministry, we recorded in the gospels, right? All the different red letters that you read. He was a man who spoke to man. But he was also God at the same time. And we love the promise and the encouragement in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and the same Lord who spoke in the Gospels to the people is the same God who can speak to our hearts and to us today. And just by a show of hands, who needs to hear a word from the Lord? Amen. We all do. We're all in the same boat. So let's learn how to hear his voice. How does God speak? Well, I want to talk about four ways we've already studied in the book of Acts so far on how the Lord speaks. I know next week, Acts chapter 13, Rob will explain how the Lord was, uh, the, the church was ministering to the Lord and the Lord spoke, but I'll let that, I'll give that over to him. But so far in the book of Acts, we see God speak. Number one, he speaks audibly. God speaks audibly. Turn with me to Acts chapter nine, verses three through six. I want to read this account with you because God speaks audibly. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, where we are in the story in the book of Acts at this point right now, Saul is on his way to kill Christians, and God, by his grace, intervenes, and he speaks to Saul. It says this, as he, so speaking of Saul, journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So number one, God speaks Audibly, And I take so much comfort in this passage because was Saul walking in obedience to God's word? No. He was in complete disobedience, right? He thought he was being obedient to God's will, but he was going out and killing Christians. He was an unbeliever at this point, yet God in his infinite mercy and grace reaches out to Saul and audibly speaks to him. Now I'll ask you this question. If God is willing to speak to an unbelieving Saul, to get him on the right track, how much more is he willing to speak to his beloved children that he calls the bride of Christ? God wants to speak, and he's able to speak audibly. Number two, following that story, Acts chapter 9, verses 10 to 16, God is able to speak through visions. Just by a show of hands, who's ever had the Lord speak to them in a vision before? Wonderful. 
How many of you have heard the audible voice of the Lord before? Wonderful. That's awesome. That's cool. In Acts chapter 9, we see God speaking to Ananias. This is not the same as Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. This is a different Ananias. And God speaks to him in a vision. Read with me Acts chapter 9, same chapter, verses 10 to 16. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision. Wow. Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord What a wonderful response. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so we have here God speaking to Ananias. And there's a conversation going back and forth in a vision. What a wild thought. But like some of you, you had that experience. What an amazing thing that God can speak audibly, but also he can speak by his, uh, he can speak in a vision. Now, God will also speak to Cornelius in a vision in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. God will also speak to Peter in a vision in Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. And it's so cool that God would speak and reach out to these men in order to get their attention, in order for the gospel to advance. And that's one thing that I've learned about the Lord. When he speaks, it's for his glory, and it's for his kingdom's cause. The Lord never speaks and it makes it all about us. The Lord speaks to encourage us to then go out and glorify his name. Because you'll see Cornelius, he receives the gospel. Peter then has the understanding that God is bringing the gospel to the nations. And so when God speaks, we must move because it is for his glory and it is for his kingdom advancement. Also, so number one, God speaks audibly. Number two, God speaks in visions. Number three, God is able to speak by his spirit. Well, wait a second. We just read that in Hebrews chapter 1, God speaks through us by his son, Jesus. So then how can he speak through us by his spirit? Well, here's the thing. This is just another proof text of the Trinity, or some would say triunity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three different personalities and ministries and emphasis, but they're all the same being. How can you understand that? It's just God, okay? But we see that God speaks to us, the Father, through his Son, but also the Spirit speaks, and obviously this is all because they are all God. So God is able to speak to us by his Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, verses 19 to 20, Peter is praying, and three times God gives him, remember we studied this, a vision of, a, of all these animals who, who Peter at the time thought they were unclean, and they come down in a sheet, and, and God says, Jesus says to Peter, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And this was done three times. And Peter's like, no, nothing unclean has ever touched my mouth. And Jesus says, don't call unclean what I call clean. And so this was just further confirmation of God giving the gospel to the Gentiles. And so he's thinking about this, this Peter. And in Acts chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, when Peter thought about the vision, it says, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. And therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So the Spirit is able to speak. And Peter was able to discern that that was the Spirit speaking to his heart in order for him to go down to Cornelius' house. We also have in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, seven times, John records, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's the thing. We all have ears, but not all of us are listening. John writes, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. And here is the hard part, I would say, or maybe the thing that we need to wrestle with in hearing from the Holy Spirit. Because now the Holy Spirit is in us, we are now the temples of God, the Holy Spirit is able to speak to us. But often, and I'm guilty of this too, and Paul would explain that we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God that was given to us for the day of our redemption, and we can quench his work in our lives. 
How many of you can admit to, yeah, I've grieved the Holy Spirit before, or I've quenched his work in my life? How do we do that? Number one, I think that we can be quenching and grieving the Spirit of God when we're being disobedient to his word. You can read more on this on Ephesians chapter 4, that when we are being disobedient to the word of God, we quench and we grieve the Holy Spirit in us. When we're disobedient to the word or when we're distracted by the things of the world, we are grieving and quenching the spirit of the Lord. And when we're making the daily decisions to ignore his promptings, we are grieving the spirit of the Lord in him. Man, I can confess that I've been in seasons where I'm complaining, Lord, I can't hear you. But God is like saying, I've always been here. You've just been over there doing your own thing. We can ignore and quench the Holy Spirit. Here's the beautiful truth. God will never leave us nor forsake us, and there's always time to come back to that first love ministry where we're hearing from the Spirit of God, where we're communing with Jesus by the Spirit of God. And if you feel this, this morning that, hey, I feel like God has been so far away from me, man, this is a word for you that the Lord has never left you, that he is with you today, even right now, and he's speaking to you because we're reading his word. So God speaks audibly, God speaks in visions. God speaks by his spirit. But God is also speaking through his word. Because in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 21, Peter quotes Joel chapter 2 to explain how God would pour out a spirit upon the men and women. You guys remember the story, Acts chapter 2. The early church is waiting upon the Lord, and the, Holy Spirit, the sound of a mighty rushing wind comes, and, and the men and women are filled with the Holy Spirit, and are baptized in his presence, and they start speaking in tongues, and now everyone who's visiting Jerusalem at the time, they're saying, oh, they must be drunk, and Peter uses Joel chapter 2, the word of God speaking through him, and he says, no, this is what was prophesied in Joel chapter 2, that in these days, God would pour his spirit upon all men and all women. And so the Holy Spirit brought to remembrance, I believe, Joel chapter 2, and the Word of God was teaching the unbelievers that this is the Spirit of of the Lord. This is God's plan to bring salvation to the world. And about that that day, 3,000 people were saved that day, it says in the book of Acts. What a wonderful thing. But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit and the Word, they're still speaking. He's still speaking. And we know that the Word is still speaking to us because in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, The author encourages and writes that the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So here's the beautiful thing. When we open God's word, we're not only reading it, but it's reading us because the word of God is living and powerful. And it's discerning the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Sometimes I don't even know what I'm feeling or what I'm going through. And I open up the word, especially in the Psalms. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I'm feeling. Oh yeah, that's what I'm going through. Because the word of God is living and powerful. And it's a, it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's the one sorting me out. And so I love that, yeah, the word of God is like a mirror. And it's reading us. And Lord willing, we're allowing the word to read us. And the spirit is, uh, is, is conforming us into the image of Jesus from one degree of glory to the next. So God speaks to us audibly. Cool. He speaks to us in visions. He speaks to us by his spirit. He speaks to us through the word. So here's the question. What does God's voice sound like? What does his voice sound like? There seems to be a tone spectrum of what God's voice sounds like. On one end of the spectrum... We have that still small voice. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have the Lord practically shouting. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 to 13. This is where we get on one side of the spectrum, the sweet and still small voice or the whisper of the Lord. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 and 13, Elijah is going through it. He needs to be ministered by the Lord. He needs to hear from the Lord. And we have this account where God says to him, 1 Kings 19, 11 to 13, then God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. 
So it was when Elijah heard that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So on one side of the spectrum, we have the Lord speaking in a still, small voice. And if he chooses to speak in a still, small voice, I guess the question is, are we slowing down to listen to the whispers of the Lord? So he whispers, but also on the other side of it, the sound of a trumpet, right? In Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 to 11, John writes, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. Whoa. He whispers but he also is assertive and loud. He's practically shouting out who he is to John in Revelation chapter one, how beautiful it is. And here's the thing, the Lord knows how and in which way to speak to you in every season of your life. Sometimes, like Elijah, we want the Lord to speak in the fire and in the wind and the earthquake. We want this big momentous thing, but God is wanting just to whisper his promises to us. And we need to slow down and tune our ears to his spirit. And sometimes the Lord's like revealing so much and we're like, oh my gosh, this is so much. Can we go back to the whispers? And the Lord knows how and when to speak because he's the good shepherd. More on that later. Turn with me to a very interesting passage in Psalm 29 where David writes about the voice of the Lord. I'd like to read the psalm in its entirety. So let's turn together. Psalm 29. David writes, give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syria, and like a wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flame of fire. That's amazing. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says, glory. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood. And the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. I love this. David writing about the tone or the voice of the Lord. It's powerful. It's majestic. And I don't know this, the, the, the articulation of making the deer give birth, but maybe it's gentle like, hey, birth, deer. Or maybe it's like he's so big that the deer is like, oh, I give him birth. You know, I don't know. I wonder what the voice of the Lord like to make Ellen give birth, right? What is that going to be like? <laughs> but the Lord is speaking, here's the point, and he has a spectrum of tones that he uses. And I love Charles Spurgeon who says, the Lord's voice has many tones, all equally divine. Many tones, all equally divine. And here's the thing, it's not a competition. (laughs) Like I used to think, oh, they get visions, they get dreams, they can hear from the Spirit, and I can only get revelation as I read the Word of God. Many tones, all equally divine. What does the voice of the Lord sound like in your life? Let's be simple in this matter. The Lord sounds like Jesus. The Lord sounds like Jesus and what he's written in his word. So here's some encouragement too, that if you're processing and you're thinking you're hearing from the Lord, but it's against the very nature of Jesus or against the character of Jesus or the promises in the word, you can automatically dismiss that voice or those thoughts of not being like the Lord or being the Lord. Because the Lord will never contradict himself. God sounds like Jesus. Jesus is the word. Man, if you're feeling something or feeling an impression or you're hearing something that is contradictory to Jesus, his character, the word, you can automatically dismiss that voice as not being from the Lord. Because God speaks to us by his son. Here is some practical things that we can do to learn to hear him. We can position ourselves to encounter his presence. We can position ourselves to encounter his presence. Paul, in Acts chapter 10, he was praying. 
and the Lord spoke to him. Cornelius had that lifestyle, it says in the book of Acts chapter 10, that he daily practiced prayer. So we can take the truths of James chapter four that as we draw near to him, he draws near to us. So as we position ourselves to encounter his presence, he will speak. Now it may take some time because God's not a magical genie on our own time schedule, but he will speak. And oftentimes, speaking by the Spirit is bringing to remembrance the things of the Word of God that you've already hidden in your heart. Or bringing to remembrance a sermon that is a principle found in Scripture and that the Lord is reminding you of. Or even when he seems to be completely silent, you can look back at the cross and know that the Lord says, I love you. Because in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul writes, God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So even when we're in those seasons of, Lord, I can't hear your voice, think about the cross, and the cross screams and declares you are unconditionally loved. And maybe that's the word that you needed to hear today, that the Lord calls you his beloved, that you are the apple of his eye, that you are unconditionally loved by God Almighty. So we position ourselves to encounter his presence. Paul was praying, Cornelius practiced daily prayer, And this was just an example of what it looks like in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 to 13, where Jeremiah writes, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with half of your heart. Oh, no. What is it? Amen. With all of your heart. What does it mean, all of your heart? I struggle with that. And I think it is, you have that conscience saying, Lord, here is all of me. The truth is, there's more of you that you don't even know that needs to be surrendered. But I love the fact that the Lord meets us with where we're at. Lord, here is all of me. And with all of me, I'm going to seek your face. I'm going to position myself in your presence. I'm going to read your word. I'm going to pray. I need to hear from you. And often as you're communing with the Lord, the Lord reveals more of your heart that's not surrendered than like, okay, Lord, with all of this part two, I give it as well. So with all of your heart, the promise is you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. This is a wholehearted seeking. It also brings to remembrance 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18, where Paul writes, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? I love this definition. It says, uh, praying without ceasing is saying, good morning, Lord, first thing, and saying good night at the end of the day. That every moment of my day, all those hours, is just an ongoing conversation with the Lord. It's inviting him to every aspect. Lord, I was thinking this. What's your thoughts on that? Or, Lord, I find myself in this circumstance with this tension in my family or this set of circumstances, what, what, ha- what do you have to say about it? And it's given the Lord space to speak. It's, a pro- it's part of practicing his presence. So it's saying, good morning, Lord, and good night at the end of the day. And even when we sleep, I would say, Lord, speak to me in my dreams. I just need the Lord. So we can live in a lifestyle of prayer. We can be quick to acknowledge the Lord and invite him to the uh, events of our day. But we also need to respond in obedience. When we hear the voice of the Lord, and and we're learning to hear him. We're never going to know if it's really the Lord. There's always going to be an element of faith, okay? But as you step out, and you're seeing, okay, here's the fruit of what's happening. Then you can go back and re-examine, Lord, did I hear you? Was this not you? All those different things. This is what it is to have an ongoing relationship with Jesus. And here's the thing, the muddy middle here on earth, it gets messy. I've been convicted because sometimes I've been so certain that this is the Lord, And then I've had to apologize for people saying, you know what, actually, I misspoke. (laughs) And I said that this was the Lord, but this is not the Lord. And and the Lord is so gracious to teach us to fine tune. I guess it's a journey. I know that it's a journey in hearing him and better to hear him, uh, better learning to hear him. So you can have grace upon yourself as you're stepping out to hear from the Lord. Um, So there's always going to be an element of faith when it comes to hearing the Lord. But also, how can we learn to hear the, the, the Lord's voice? Read the word. We can't be complaining when we're not able to hear God when our Bibles are off to the side collecting dust, right? These are guaranteed places of encounter with God. When we open up his word and meditate on the scriptures, we draw near to him, he draws near to us. Let's be simple in this matter. You want to to hear from the Lord? Open up your Bible and read. And often it is going to be the promises of the Lord 
and the principles in Scripture that will be like Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. We need the word for every step. Lord, I need you here. Lord, I need you here. Lord, I need you over here. Every step of the way, the word of God is able to be the lamp unto our feet and the light to our path. The first time I ever felt the Lord speak to my heart, I thought I was going crazy. <laughs> it was beautifully divine. I was 17 years old in Bible college, braces and everything. I was a hot mess, right? And at the point of my life, I was in a really big, just family tension that I created. In fact, I was so awful in my family that the best course of action was for them to actually kick me out. So I was homeless for about three months, as much as you could be homeless in Marietta Temecula, you know? But uh, I was, you know, in friends' garages and on the couches and all the different things because I tore down relationships with my mom and my dad and I didn't want to be a part of the family. So they said, you don't want to be a part? Here's the door. And I said, okay, I can do this myself. Well, fast forward a couple of months, we have a family meeting and at the end of that meeting, the, I had two choices. I could go back home graciously, live under my parents' rules, and commute to Palomar from Marietta at that time, or I can go to Bible college. My dad said, I'd pay for your semester at Bible college. You can go there full-time as a student. And I said, I'm not going to live with you. I'm going to go to the Bible college so I can plan what to do for the next four months. Right? That was my get-out-of-trouble get out uh, uh, solution. So it was 17 years old. This is uh, the fall of 2008, and I'm in these classes. I'm hearing the Word of God being taught. I'm surrounded by people who are my age but loving Jesus, and I thought, that's weird. But the Lord was slowly softening my heart, and we came to a place in Thanksgiving break, 2008 in the fall, where everyone had packed up their stuff to go for the Thanksgiving break and vacation, and I'm afraid to go home. I'm afraid to go home. Number one, I'm uh, embarrassed. I'm ashamed. Uh, I feel like that there's no hope for me in restoration with my family. I chose the easy way of escape because I didn't want to live under my family's rule. There's no way that they would uh, you know, come, uh, you know, appreciate me back or welcome me back. And I remember top bunk in my room, I, I prayed this prayer. I said, Lord, if you're real, speak to me. I was in the book of Genesis that time in the classes, and I was like reading that like God spoke the things into existence. I'm like, God, if you could do that, you could speak to me here in my dorm room. And for the first time, and I would say almost audibly, there was an impression upon my heart that just said, Psalm 46. And I said, thought to myself, that's weird. <laughs> but I opened up the scriptures and I turned to Psalm 46 and the first two verses says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. And then it goes on to Psalm, uh, Psalm 46, verse 10, where it says, Be still and know that I am God. On the top bunk of my Bible college dorm room, I got on my knees, lifted up my hands, and I said, God, you're real. You're real. Thank, praise God. And ever since then, that has kind of been a mode of communication that I've learned to discern the Lord's voice. That same prompting in my heart where I'm like, okay, Lord, that's you. And I've had to table some things because I'm like, there's no way that's the Lord. And then all of a sudden, I'm in a conversation and that person brings up that exact same verse or that exact same principle in scripture. Or I'm listening on K-Wave and the person's teaching on that passage. And I'm like, that is the Lord. In my life, I've learned to discern that God rarely speaks in solo, but often in orchestra. So it's not just one voice that I'm hearing. I'm hearing the whole orchestra say, hey, whatever the Lord is wanting me to, 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 to know and to uh, receive. And so, so... The question is, how does God speak to you? If he is this all-powerful God, omnipotent yet intimate, how does he speak to you? So here's some encouragements in listening. Number one, God wants you to know his voice more than you do. Think about the message of the gospel. God bankrupted the treasures of heaven, Jesus Christ, his son, so that he can come and live a life that we, uh, sorry, live the life and die the death that we deserved on that cross. How much more is God willing to give you his spirit or to speak with you or to have communion with you? If that was the lengths in the gospel that he was willing to come and rescue us from ourselves and the penalty of our sin, how much more does he want you to be with him? God wants you to know his voice more than you do. Second encouragement, God, our shepherd, knows his sheep. 
John chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by them. In John chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So here's the thing. God knows how to speak to us collectively, but God also knows how to speak to us individually. He knows his individual sheep. He knows when you need the whispers of the Lord, the whispers of his voice. He knows when he needs to actually put it on like amplified version and like, hey, you need to pay attention to this. God knows. The Lord knows because he's the good shepherd. He's the creator. We are the creation. He knows how to speak to us. And I believe if we're willing to posture ourselves in his presence, to tune our ears to his spirit, we'll be able to hear his voice more clearly. More clearly. But here's another encouragement. Peter, in his life in the book of Acts, there's like, there's, there seems to be like a rule of three in his lives. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? How many times did Jesus say to Peter in John 21, do you love me in his restoration? How many times in Acts chapter 10 did that vision come to Peter? Interesting. Three times. Three, three, and three. There, I think there had to be like a little bit of a, like a pact that he and Jesus had like, hey, Peter, you know it's going to be me when the, the three. You know what I mean? But here's the thing. The Lord knows how to speak to us. He knows how to speak to you. He knows what circumstances you're in. He knows what you need to hear and when to hear it. And he knows how to speak to you because he is that good shepherd. And even when he seems to be silent again, the cross of Jesus declares that we are unconditionally loved by him. A couple of other encouragements. We need to hear the Lord, especially in hard and uncertain seasons. We will find ourselves in hard and uncertain seasons. And as we learn to listen to God's voice, we need to hear him all the more clearly. And when he is silent, you can fall back on these three things. Chuck Smith taught this. When everything is uncertain, when you can't hear the Lord, when you can't see his hand move, fall back on these three things. Number one, God is good. Number two, he has a plan. And number three, he is always on time. Let the Holy Spirit bring that to your remembrance because he is always good. God is good. He has a plan. And number three, he's always on time. And I'll say this, his time schedule is very different from our time schedule. Amen? Man, we're still learning to submit to that every single day. But there are seasons of silence as we walk with the Lord. I want you to be encouraged to press on because every season has a beginning. Every season has an end. Keep on asking, seeking, and knocking because the Lord will answer and he will be found. So here's some practical application. We talked about, does God still speak today? Yes, what a glorious and wonderful truth that is. Number one, bless him for that. Lord, you speak, you're able, you're awesome. But be warned that there are many voices that we could listen to. We can listen to the world, we could be listening to the voices of the flesh or even the enemy or it's the Lord. Here's the tricky thing about the enemy. We know in Luke chapter four and Matthew chapter four, the enemy was actually using scripture to tempt Jesus. So he was using God's own word to, to tempt God. <laughs> and here's a, a hard reality. The enemy knows the scriptures better than you probably do. So how do we know if it's the Lord then, if he can use the scriptures? Well, the Lord will never contradict himself, right? So you must be a student of the word of God. You must rightly divide the word of truth. You must be in the word of God first and foremost, right? To know his voice, to know how he leads you. So then when the counterfeit comes and those lies come, you can be like, that's not the Lord because this is the Lord. But here's also another beautiful grace that we have together. In a multitude of counselors, there is safety. I am so thankful for the men and women, the soundboards in my life, that I, if I feel the Lord saying something or impressing something upon my heart, I can bounce those things off to them with no judgment, and they can pray with me and help me discern if this is the Lord's leading or not. In fact, it was a couple of uh, some guys, right, that it was in that season of like, hey, I really like Ellen, and this and that, and you know, is this the Lord? They're like, you don't even have to pray about that. Like, duh, she's the one, you know. But anyways, no, no, that's because she's so great, right? But they prayed with me. Lord, we don't want to be led by the flesh. We don't want to be led by our own motives or our own kingdom's advancement. We want to hear from you. And the Lord was able to use those guys to encourage me to actually bring some further confirmation. Ellen's the one, like, what are you waiting for? So I got that ring, right? I got down one knee and I proposed. And she said, yes, so praise God. But, okay, so... We talked about that God still speaks today, amen. So ask yourself this question, what can you do today to better hear God's voice tomorrow? For example, if you're in that season where he's speaking to you in those small whispers, what might you need to do to maybe take away from your schedule, to sit with the Lord for maybe an extended period of time to wait on him? 
Are there things in your agenda that need to be shuffled around because priority needs to be priority? I need, we need to hear from the Lord. If God is in the season where he's shouting at you, what is he trying to communicate with you? It's probably something important and you need to take note and walk in obedience to his leading. We talked about some encouragements and learning to listen that God wants you to know his voice more than you do. So you can ask yourself this question, how does God speak to me? Men, women, ask yourself this question, how does God speak to me? And if you're a parent, fathers and mothers, you can ask, how does, you can ask, you can ask your children, how does God speak to you, children? And it'd probably be a beautiful conversation as to how they're discerning the voice of the Lord. And then you can ask yourself this, if you're a parent, what can I do better as a parent in order for my children to better hear from the Lord? As we close out, I'm going to invite the worship team back up. There's a, a couple of prompts that the Lord kind of put in my heart as to the reason why we need to learn to hear God's voice. Number one is because he has a plan and he wants his plans to be prosperous because in his prosperous plans, he is glorified and we are edified. But also number two, there's a lot of tension as we wait upon the Lord to hear his voice, to discern his leading and a couple of different applications for us to respond to as the worship band plays. The first one is this. We need to be asking and inviting the Lord to speak into areas of our life where we need clarity and direction. We need to be asking the Lord and inviting him to speak into the areas where we need clarity and direction. Number two, we need to be asking God for strength and endurance through the seasons of silence. And those, those seasons of silence, I'll tell you this, the enemy is always ready right there whispering those lies that he's not good, that he's not on time, that he doesn't know what he's doing. And so you need strength and endurance. Or thirdly, this is what the Lord pressed upon me firstly, was that I need to come back to first love ministry. First love ministry, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to read to you Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, where Jesus is speaking to his church, and they're doing great things, but... The Lord has one thing against them. He says this, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored by namesake and have not become weary. These are all great things. But nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Not lost, but you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Here's the, the Lord convicted me of as I was learning to hear his voice. I've left first love ministry for the sake of ministry, practical ministry. And I needed to get on my knees and repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. But maybe that's just not for me, but it's for you as well where you've been busy, and even busy with good things, but you've neglected the best thing, which is first love ministry. It's relationship where you're communing and hearing from the Lord, and you're having an ongoing conversation with him throughout the day. I want to invite you, as we respond, to think about those three things. Number one, invite the Lord to speak into areas of life where you need some clarity and direction. Number two, ask God for strength and endurance through hard seasons of silence. And number three, come back to first love ministry. The prayer team will be up here. The worship team will close us out in worship. You can remain seated so that people who would want to respond in prayer by coming to the front can easily move throughout the rows. And towards the last couple of songs, we can all stand up and glorify the Lord. But ask him in this time, Lord, let me hear your voice. Can I hear your voice? And what are you speaking to me? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you and we love you. We thank you, Lord, that you speak We thank you, Jesus, that you have words to speak over our lives today. I pray, Jesus, that we would hear you, that we would hear you. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are in that hard season of just needing clarity. Lord, would you be their solution? Would you be their guide? I pray, Lord, for those who just are in that season of (laughs) waiting and they, they need endurance through that season of silence. Lord, I pray that you would speak to them that you would remind them of your presence, that you never leave them nor forsake them. And Jesus, I pray for myself and for the brothers and sisters who need to come back to first love ministry. Lord, forgive us for making it not about you when it's all about you. We repent of that and we confess that before you and we come before you 
wanting to be changed by you. So here we are, Lord. Speak to our hearts. Let us know your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we respond, feel free to come up for prayer, or you can pray in your, your, your spots there with a friend. But we have some extra time here just to give our, ourselves some time to respond to what the Lord may be speaking to us. Let's surrender and let's worship him.